Hi, Kate. Welcome to Book Chats. Hello, Sophie. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. I'm very excited to be chatting to you today. Oh, I'm just excited to look at your bookshelves behind you, actually. <laughs> I'm just trying to work out what's in there. I, I know. do it every time I'm on a Zoom. I'm like, oh, what have they got? <laughs> You're always checking out the background. I was doing the same to you. That's so funny. So, um, <laughs> Congratulations on the success of The Motherfold. It's been a, been a wild ride, I'm sure, the last couple of months. It has been a wild ride from, you know, the comfort of my own little room just here because that's the only place I've been for the last couple of months, which yes. is uh, quite hilarious. But I did get out to some bookshops on the weekend uh, and that was amazing. And I was like a kid in a candy store and so excited. <laughs> oh, yeah, it would have felt really special. It's been um, yeah, definitely a funky year for releasing books, but on the plus side, people have been reading more than ever. So yes, that's worked in your favor as well. I'm sure it would have. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Lovely. So for those that haven't read the book already, um, The Mother Fault is the story of Mim, a geologist, mother of two, um, who's living in a dystopian Australia, um, where the department, the governing body of the day, has um, put tracking chips in the entire population. Um, and we find out really early on that her husband, Ben, has gone missing from a mine site in Indonesia. Can you run us through what happens next? Yeah. So isn't it strange that it, it, it feels less and less dystopian every day? But so... Ben's gone missing. She's annoyed as any woman at home with two kids would be <laughs> that her husband's gone missing, <laughs> whether it's his own fault or not. Um, and when she reaches out to uh, the department, to Ben's work to try and work out where he is, um, everyone kind of fobs her off. And then the department really very subtly, but very clearly threatens her to, um, to stay in place, not to move, not to ask too many questions. They take her passport and they, they threaten that if she does move, they might take her children away Ooh, from her. To the um, notorious best life. How scary is that? To the life? notorious best life. Yeah. What the kids say in school, you know, careful, you'll get sent to best life. Mm -hmm. These estates that the department set up. And so she, t she takes off. She's terrified. She doesn't know what to do. She goes back um, to her mum's place to the family farm i love uh, it that's the and, first thing she thinks to do go back to mum's place mum will know what yeah to <laughs> go go to mum exactly and she's got of course that really fraught relationship with the place and with her brother who's taken over the farm there and and still the grief um because her dad's passed away um but but yeah i think it is a very um kind of instinctive uh, feeling that you just go, okay, yeah, I, I need to go home. I, she yeah. thinks if I get home, I'll be able to think. I'll, I'll just be able to think. The kids will be okay. And of course, that problem of the fact that she has her kids with her all the time, you know, all, all the time. So she, yeah, so she needs to kind of work out what she's doing, mm. but it doesn't go to plan, of course. No, of course it doesn't. Um, well, it was just. <laughs> Such an amazing story. I loved it so much, but I would really love to know where the spark for the story came from. You mentioned something in your author's note about it, but I'd love to know where the, yeah, where the seed came from. Yeah. So it's the story. Um, it's taken me about four years to, to get this book out. And really it, it was just when I, I was getting my first book out that the idea came to me and I, my girls now are nine and seven, but they were much younger then. And I was really in the throes of kind of having kids around me all the time. It was the kinder child care, care years. And, um, and, and at the same time, the, the news cycle was full of, um, women with their children seeking asylum. Mm. Um, it was deep in kind of that Syrian crisis then. And, and so in my head each day, I, I was watching these stories and thinking, you know, how impossible it would be to be in those positions and thinking about the fact that, you know, I would do anything as would m most parents to protect my children. Um, I would die for them, put my body on the line for them. And yet every day by six o'clock, I was ready to throw my children in the rubbish <laughs> bin <laughs> yes. because I was over it because of that, you know, total frustration, the, the neediness of you all the time, that feeling that I would sometimes have. And that I know so many of my girlfriends had, which was like, what happened here? Like, where yeah. did my life go? What, what's yeah. happened to my life? Yeah. And so I couldn't, uh, what I wanted to explore was those two feelings, the feeling that I, I adore my children so much. I want to, eat them and have them back, <laughs> you know, as part of my body. They're so incredible um, and astonishing every day. And also I want to get in my car and drive as far as uh, away as far I can because possible. I'm over it. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and that really shone through in the book too. I think Mim was such a strong character. I, I loved reading someone like that, like everything you just said, that she loves her kids and would do absolutely anything for them but still mm. feels really constrained by motherhood and like her identity has really shifted from, from Mim to, to now mum. Um, yeah. And she talks about her life before and after Essie, her first um, firstborn daughter. And I love that idea of like the fragmented version of yourself. Like that really, mm. really spoke to me. Um, have you had a really big response um, to that from readers? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, and I'm so glad you said that, Sophie. And yes, certainly. And uh, it will come as no surprise that it is a lot of women and I assume a lot of mothers who are um, getting in contact with me to say, you know, you you looked inside me to get this. Um, and, and I think that, yes, that sense of um, losing track of oneself or of feeling like those previous selves have all just got lost, oh, um, been yeah. subsumed, you know, um, and, and that, that idea in the book that to be, I suppose your stronger self or your true self, the, the realest version of, of you, you can be, it is incorporating all those flawed versions, all the, the times, um, that you were someone else, that you were a, a daughter first and maybe a lover and, and then maybe a wife, maybe not, but all of those, those parts of yourself, mm. um, need to be incorporated together. So that's what I wanted to kind of play with. I'm glad that you, yeah. you saw that oh, in there. You did it really well. It just, it was really, um, it's really validating, I think, just to, yeah, to read all of those things and know that you're not alone in those thoughts. So that was, um, that was by no means the biggest part of the story, but it was one of the things that I found the most, um, yeah, the most amazing. So I'm really, really glad that how well, I'm really proud of, of you and how well you did that. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so on, on Mim as well, I'm really curious about whether you had her as a character in your mind before you started writing the book or whether that was something, whether she was someone that came up from, um, like as a product of the storyline. She really, the, the first scene that I wrote, that I ever wrote of this was um, Mim at the kitchen sink. And, and you know, it's a bit different. I, I at some point in the editing, I cut the first 20,000 words of, of the book away. So, but but still the first scene is is what I wanted to get at. This very kind of domestic scene mm. that, yeah. that a lot of people could relate to of kind of, you know, juggling everything, dinner's on the go, and, um, and then having that moment of total you know, disaster striking, like, but yes. what do you mean my husband's missing? Um, and the thing that really changed with Mim, I suppose lots of people have asked me, you know, how much of, of Mim is you? And mm -hmm. I think of course, you know, she's a, she's a mum with two kids, um, you know, similar kind of age that, that I am. And, and so there was lots of my own experiences and my girlfriend's experiences that I was, I was writing into her. Having said that, one of the things that had to happen really early when I was um, looking at the plot was that I kept on asking myself, you know, Kate, what would you do if you're in this situation? And then what would you do next? And, you know, how would you get money? And and then what if you couldn't use your card? And I Googled like how to disappear. And honestly, mm -hmm. my Google history is just ridiculous. <laughs> but I said, um, what I kept coming up against was the fact that I would ask for help and that my girlfriends would, would help me and yeah. they would do yeah. <laughs> anything to help me. And so I, I knew too that I needed to get her moving, to get her on the road, which is, which is what I wanted. Um, I needed to make her a little bit of a loner. So, so that was a really defining moment of her kind of, um, getting up and walking away from me as a character. Like, mm. okay, this is, this is me now. This is it's my experience. Yeah. And, and it allowed me to, yeah, it allowed me to really see her as this separate being. And of course the geology, um, that was important to me too. Mm. I have no background, like year 10 geography or something is what I did. So, <laughs> but I, I became obsessed with geology and like this, this whole, um, shelf of books up uh -huh. here on geology. And I went and sat in on, you know, lectures, first year lectures on geology oh, just to, amazing. yeah, to get this, to get this sense of, of how she would see the world. And, and especially how she would see something like um, those years of having babies, which can seem endless. I mean, a night can seem endless, like, yeah. <laughs> but and how someone who thinks of time as, you know, so enormous, how they might see it too. So, yeah, yeah. so that's where she came from. Oh, it's amazing. And I think like the level of research that went into this book was amazing. Um, and that really has shone through. 
Um, but I, I would love to know more about your experience um, on board a yacht as part of the crew. I loved reading about that in the author's notes. <laughs> I'd love to know, yes. how did that go? Was it, I would be terrified, I think, to even have to like, oh. end up for that. So. <laughs> I was totally terrified and kind of like the minute after I sent that email, I went, oh, that's never going to happen. So I don't even have to think about it because what I wanted was I thought I don't really, I'd been on boats, but I, I was like, I don't understand sailing and I've never done that kind of blue water. I haven't been out where all I can see is, is ocean. And I really wanted to do that. And when I was researching the book, I I had a big map of Australia up on my wall and I kind of would, each time I did a redraft, I would plot out the journey that, um, that Mim travels with the kids. And, and I knew eventually that she was going to get onto a boat in Darwin and she was heading to Indonesia. And so when I was Googling like the route that you take, cause there's all those islands in Indonesia, like where are they going? Um, I found this yacht race, the Darwin to Ambon yacht rally and it had its own little you know website and they were looking for crew and i was like oh, i'll just just do it just <laughs> i'll just do it so i emailed and i was really honest i said like i have no experience um but i'm really friendly and enthusiastic and i'll do it. anything to help yeah. yeah um and i i and i said that i was writing a book i did say that i was writing a book and then i kind of didn't hear anything and i thought you know the year kind of moved on and i thought nothing's going to happen and then about 2 weeks out i got this phone call i'm still so glad i picked it up because it was an unknown number oh, and it was um <laughs> no exactly it was captain neville from darwin and he said he had a, a spot on his boat. He had had someone drop out and he needed someone to hop bunk in with the only other woman on his crew. And would I do it? And I kind of just said yes before I could even think about it. Oh, yes, worry about and, um, it later. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then I was up there um, having no idea, no idea what I'd set myself up for. It mm -hmm. was about six days on board this yacht with, with the rest of the crew. And I was hot bunking, which meant that um, – this other woman, Joy, gorgeous woman, and I would were sharing this tiny little cabin because we were on different shifts. So I was on like the oh, midnight to six a.m. Okay. shift, and I wasn't allowed to do much in case I broke anything. Yeah, that, but that um, there, considering you yeah, <laughs> exactly, I knew nothing. But I had I made like lots of cups of coffee, and I basically huh. asked questions, you know, the whole time, um, and. I was terrified. Like there was one night of weather, which I'm sure that anyone who sails would think it was so minor. It wasn't even worth speaking of. I thought I was just going to die like completely. And I wrote in my journal cause I took, yeah, I took all my notes with me cause I, I wanted to really get a sense of everything and take notes about everything. And, um, and I've got written in there, like, this is foolish. I'm going to die. I'm going to drown out here. And everyone will say, you know, how silly were you going off onto this yacht? But it was amazing. And so for the other thing that the other reason it was so influential and, and inspiring for, for the book is that when we got then to Ambon in Indonesia, I had about two or three days then on the island. We all did. And there were lots yep. of, we visited the schools and we, we went to the mayor's house for dinner and there were parties and all sorts of things. And I was staying in a hotel by that stage, but you know, I've traveled a lot and I've traveled a lot with my family and my two little kids um, and in difficult places, but it had been so long since I had been on my own and, you know, able to just make decisions at the corner, like where I'm going to go for lunch or what am I going to go and look at? And so I had this kind of sense of um, reliving a, a part of my younger self when yeah. I did travel. And, and so that was really, yeah, that was really good for, for kind of um, that part of Mim where she is, reawakening to to who mm. she is as well it was yeah, amazing <laughs> that would have been and i just even listening to you talk about that experience immediately i'm thinking imagine doing that with kids like it just would have oh. been horrifying and reading oh my gosh parts of the book where mim's on the boat with her kids and it's all just getting really hairy um yep. i think i probably just would have curled up in a ball and cried and not, not yeah like it. <laughs> I wouldn't have and it. you know I did once, I took the kids out, um, just onto, you know, this tiny little out onto Port Phillip Bay on, on a friend's boat. And I was so stressed mm -hmm. the whole time, just like, you know, like you are on a pier, like, don't go over, <laughs> what are you doing close to the edge? And, and it was, it was amazing to write 
those parts on the boat because in one uh, on one level they're away from the kind of immediate danger they have to go just at the pace of what the boat can go it's idyllic there are dolphins and sunshine and there's this kind of brewing thing that's happening with her and nick Mm -hmm. but on you know and, and on the other hand it is this constant like um watching for the kids thinking about what's going to happen next so she's just in this up and down it it was great to write yeah yeah Yeah. and that really shone through just that constant and I loved even reading it the things that she would say instinctively like no don't do that or shout or whatever then she'd see the kids face fall and be like oh sorry like didn't mean it like that and would kind of have to backtrack into mum mode and not be on such like safety warden mode that was um yeah it was really relatable too so um now, this question is going to be a bit tough to answer without spoilers, okay, but I know I'll I'm going to get slammed <laughs> if I don't ask you about that ending. <laughs> okay. So it's really, yeah, hard to talk about this. I can, this. I can talk around it. I can talk around it. So so the ending of the book, um, the, the kind of final image of the book, I always had in my head. I always knew, authors often talk about this idea of kind of um, writing towards a, a point. And I knew what that point was, but I had no idea for a really long time how I was going to get there. And and so the end, probably oh, maybe the last 20 pages or so, maybe 30 pages or so, I rewrote like 30 times oh, you know wow. at, at some point at some point I'll like auction off all the other, <laughs> all the <laughs> other possible endings because there were so many and one of the things Sophie that was really hard to do is that because um there's a, a, a kind of a very climactic scene on the mm-hmm. on the boat on the yacht where um which is a really high point for Mim in terms of her character development mm-hmm. um one of the important things I talked about this a lot with my editor was was trying to obviously for a novel to work you have to go higher than that Mm -hmm. to to get to the ending so it was trying to really balance out how to make the ending work um and then the other thing is like my first book was historical fiction it was based Mm -hmm. on a true story you know it was I always knew how it had to end this one I was like you know I kind of want it to be domestic realism Mm -hmm. and I also want it to be a thriller and I also want it to be like all these other, you know, an exploration of motherhood and of, yeah. of environmental, you know, of climate kind of catastrophe and all these things. And so I was watching lots of films and um, and series to try and get that very kind of filmic ending. And at some point, maybe two years in, I remember sitting down and just thinking, this book is too smart for me. Like oh. I've actually written a book <laughs> that is too smart for me because oh. I can't work out how to finish it. But um. So, so I don't know if, if that kind of answers your question, but, but, but certainly what I realized was I had to get to a, a certain point, um, where everything that, that had been explored was kind of wrapped up to enough of an an ending that people would be satisfied. And, you know, it's always delightful when you get loads and loads of messages saying, uh, excuse me, where's the sequel? (laughs) We all need to know. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's a really lovely, um, Feeling. And of course, like as a, you know, lit fic writer or whatever, you don't, nec- you don't think about, about sequels. And mm. one of the things is that what I realized in writing that ending was that even, even like a day later, if I'd, if I'd kept on writing and I did keep on writing, you know, like there's, there's things in the future that I've written. Mm. Mm. It was, it, it introduced so many more things that it was like, oh my gosh, it, it, the, you know, it, it, it goes on. So that was the decision. I made and um yeah it's been it's been delightful to see the responses to the ending yeah. I hope that answers the question without it does, too many no, it does. it's really tough um really tough to talk about it without giving anything away but yes I know that I I read through the last oh, maybe 30 40 pages just like whipping the pages over yeah. and my eyes were just doing this <laughs> and I had to go back the next day and, and reread it because I thought I feel yeah. like I've missed something because I just have read it so fast because I yeah. just needed to know what happened so I think um, that's an amazing sign when you get to the end of a book and you're, you're just flying through it. So you're Good, really I'm well. glad. <laughs> um, I'm really glad that you brought up um, Skylarking too. So I went back and read Skylarking over the weekend, um, oh, thank your you. first novel, and I loved it. It was just, it was a really beautiful book, but I was really struck by how different it was to The Motherfold, just an, an entirely different genre thing, historical fiction. You obviously yeah. moved through to this one that, like you say, brings in all of these different um, different aspects. So 
Was that a conscious decision that you made as a writer to move into a new genre or did it just kind of happen with the spark for the story? It it was really conscious. It was really conscious and that was partly because Skylarking was so accidental. So Skylarking was written um, – the, the short version of the story is that I went back to study writing um, when my kids were really little. So my background is in teaching and I'd done that for many years. I'd wanted to write when I was at high school, um, but but someone told me I shouldn't do that this writing course because, you know, it wouldn't lead me anywhere. And um, But I went back to it when my, my kids were little. And, um, yeah, you know, in those writing courses, you do lots of writing workshops. And, and so I was writing, doing a fiction workshop and we went away on holiday, camped to this beautiful campground and camped next to a grave, which is the grave in the story of, of Skylarking. And, and I just became fascinated with it. And I, and I thought I would just write, you know, the short story that I needed to write yeah. to pass the subject. And of course, in those classes, you get such instantaneous kind of feedback from people. And they were like, okay, more, we want more of this. And so I kind of got to 30, 40,000 words without really realizing that I was writing a novel. Mm -hmm. And, and that is a gift because when you do realize you're writing a novel, that's just a whole other (laughs) kind of (laughs) level of angst. And, and then, and then I was super lucky. I, I'd entered some kind of short story writing competitions with other stuff. An editor had seen my work and liked it. And when I had about 60,000 words of Skylarking, so it wasn't even finished, I, I got a, a, um, a publishing contract for yeah. it. So when I say it was accidental, you know, it was obviously still a lot of work and I worked yeah. really hard on it then, but, but I didn't really... Um, know what I was doing. It was this gift of a story. And at the end of that, people were like, oh, you know, what historical fiction are you going to write next? And I did a lot of panels about historical fiction. I started teaching historical fiction. And I remember thinking, hang on a second. I don't want to, I never intended to write historical fiction. I love reading it. I love writing it, but you know, and um, so certainly there was part of me that was just a little bit stubborn and a little bit, hang on a second, you know, I want to show you what I think that I'm capable of in in terms of, yeah. And because I read like, like you do, you know, and all your amazing kind of bookstagram (laughs) community, I I just, I read so widely and I want to have a go at all the books. Yeah, (laughs) You know, I I want to, I really want to have a try at everything. So, so, um, you know, and, and I was advised not to publishers, publishers don't necessarily like you jumping out of your lane. (laughs) of an unknown isn't it like they know what to expect from Kate Milton Hall it is historical fiction writer but they don't know what to expect of you when exactly you hmm. yeah, yeah and they need readers to you know they, they don't want to surprise readers too much yeah. um, but it's been I also had what was terrible at the time but has turned out absolutely for the best is that I switched publishers during that time so in many ways this has felt like I got another crack at kind of New having star. a debut as well because yeah, yeah so um it's it's been fun. Having said all that, I'm going back to historical fiction for my next book. So I there think I'll go. just jump around. Well, that was gonna be my next question. More. What's next? So we just we all yeah. want to know what's next for you. So that's um I would love to know well, more of what you've got to offer. Sitting around me um at the moment, so I'm in my little beautiful writing studio and I had um pin board put up all over the walls so that I could just um yeah. pin things everywhere and it's such a mess. I I, I shan't show you, but um <laughs> I'm writing about um, 1930s Melbourne, um, oh and I'm writing about a meatworks and and an abattoir. Oh. So <laughs> I've got pictures of, uh, I've got a lot of pictures of Peaky Blinders because that's my kind oh. of filmic um, or TV oh, <laughs> TV yeah kind of inspo at the moment. And then I've got paintings and um, all of these pictures from the time, kind of historical photographs, and then I've got a timeline up the other wall. So it's just. What I find is when you're in the middle of something, it happened with Motherfold as the Motherfold as well, is that I was just obsessed. I was in it all the time. It was Breaking really hard to be quiet. Yeah. So to be, you know, members of my family or my friends, like I just would constantly be telling people, Do you know how they do surveillance in China? Or do you know how they do this? <laughs> and at the moment, I'm just totally into butchery. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. All of these books about butchery. So yeah, so that's what I'm I'm working on now, and it's um yeah it's it's exciting to be writing again because of course, the long tail of of your book publication is a lot of editing and then mm. all your promo stuff and it's hard to get um a good 
you know, a good bit of time to kind of really fall in yeah. love with your new project. But yes. I'm definitely in that very heady obsession stage at the moment. So it's great. Yeah. And like you say, it would be hard to get out of the, the obsession with one in, into another one. So it's um, it's exciting. And I really feel like you would, would be an amazing person to have on a pub trivia team or something because you would know a lot of things about just everything. <laughs> I know the the most random things though, yeah. honestly, the most random. Um, I did some, I started doing some interviews last week um, about, you know, this particular abattoir and it's so incredible when you get, you know, people who are experts, people who are experts in anything. And it was the same with sailing um, and geology. They just love to talk to you as mm. writers. And I've, yeah. I've interviewed um, and spoken to Jane Harper a, a lot about her writing process as well. And we've both said, you know, it's such an invitation when you can say to people, look, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm looking at this, my book, would you like to talk to me? So often the answer is yes. It and can tell you yeah. everything they know. It's, it's, it's a special amazing. space, I think, to, to be able to share knowledge and know that it will be turned into something amazing like yeah. the novels that you've written. So it's, um yeah, part of that wonderful book writing community, isn't it? That there's people that want to share what they know. It really is. Absolutely. It really is the best. The best part. Um, so the last question I have for you today, Kate, is what have you been reading lately or is there any books that you would like to recommend that we should read? Oh, I totally would. Now, I haven't got one of them here. I've got definitely one of them here. I don't know if you've already read It's Been a Pleasure, Noni Blake. I haven't read it, but everyone has been telling oh. me too, so I'm definitely <laughs> it's, Oh, my goodness. It's so good. Claire Christian is just a delight. And I got sent this because I um I do a podcast as well, the first time podcast. Yes. And so um, we're interviewing her next year. We haven't had time this season, but it was in the middle of lockdown. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to have a little crack at this and, and see what it's like. And I just could not put it down. It was so joyous and happy and it made me laugh and it's sexy and great. I just... I loved it so much. I, needs in 2020. Yeah, I wholeheartedly recommend it. And the one, the one, I, I don't have a copy here, but the one that I think will um will win all the awards this year is Song of the Crocodile by Nadi oh, Simpson, which um before. yes, so that's that came out with Hachette. I think I interviewed her recently for the podcast. She's just extraordinary. It's her mm -hmm. first novel, but she's a singer songwriter, um, Aboriginal woman, and it's just epic kind of family saga love story story of a, a town it's just beautiful so they're my two recommendations oh, amazing i can't wait both of those are going straight to the top of the pile <laughs> excellent i'm so glad amazing. thank you so much for talking with me today kate it's been wonderful oh sophie it's been such a pleasure thank you and thank you for all you do for readers and and authors with um your account too thank you that's so kind of you to say <laughs> all right see ya see ya